Okay, on this video, we're going to continue on reading from Ralph Waldo Emerson's essays. I know a couple of videos back, I said it's Ralph Waldo Emerson's books. I actually prefer to refer to his writings as his essays. It makes it easier. Please do leave your thoughts, your feedback, your comments. Please share your thoughts. I want to hear your ideas that you picked up from this reading. And does my reading resonate with you? What do you think about my style of reading? I want to hear more about it. By all means, do share your feedback. And um, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule, your busy day, to read with me this amazing book. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And please leave your thoughts, comments, etc. And your feedback will be much appreciated. Okay, let's get on with it. New England Reformers, lecture read before the Society in Armory Hall on Sunday, March 3rd, 1844. Hmm, we have a date there. In the suburb in the town, on the railway, in the square, came a beam of goodness down, doubling daylight everywhere. Peace now, each for malice takes, beauty for his sinful weeds, for the angel hope Aya makes, him an angel whom she leads. Whoever had an opportunity of an acquaintance with society in New England during the last 25 years, with those middle and with those leading sections that may constitute, may constitute any just representation of the character and aim of the community, will have been struck with the great activity of thought in exper experimenting. His attention must be command commanded by the signs that the church or religious party is falling from the church nominal and is appearing in temperance and non-resistance societies. In movements of abolitionists and of socialists and very significant assemblies called Sabbath and Bible conventions composed of altruists, of seekers, of all the soul, of the soldiery, of the soldiery of dissent, and meeting the core question of the authority of the Sabbath, of the priesthood, and of the church. In these movements, nothing was more remarkable than the discontent they begot in the movers. The spirit of protest and of detachment drove the members of these conventions to bear testimony against the church and immediately afterwards to declare their discontent with their com these conventions, their independence of their colleagues and their impatience of the methods whereby they were working. They defied each other like a congress of kings, each of whom had a realm to rule and a way of his own that made concert unprofitable. Concert unprofitable. What a fertility of projects for the salvation of the world. One apostle thought all men should go to farming, and another that no man should buy or sell, that the use of money was a cardinal evil, another that the mischief was in our diet, that we eat and drink damnation. These made unleavened bread, and we were foes to the death, to fermentation. It was in vain, urged by the housewife, that God made yeast as well as dough, and loves fermentation just as dearly as he loves vegetation. That fermentation develops the saccharine element in the grain and makes it more palatable and more digestible. No, they wish the pure wheat and will die, but it shall not, it shall not ferment. Stop, dear nature, these incessant advances of thine. Let us scotch these ever-rolling wheels. Others attack the system of agriculture, the use of animal manures in farming, and the tyranny of man over brute nature. These abuses polluted his food. The ox must be taken from the plow and the horse from the cart. The hundred acres of the farm must be spaded. And the man must walk wherever boats and locomotives will not carry him. Even the insect world was to be defended and has been too long neglected. In a society 
for the protection of ground worms, slugs, and mosquitoes was to be incorporated without delay. With these appeared the adepts of homeopathy, of hydropathy, of mesmerism, of phrenology, and their wonderful theories of the Christian miracles. Others assailed particular vocations, as that of the lawyer, that of the merchant, of the manufacturer, of the clergyman, of the scholar. Others attacked the institution of marriage as a fountain of social evils. Others devoted themselves to the warring of churches and meetings to public worship and the fertile forms of atenominism. Among the elder Puritans seemed to have their match in the plenty of the new harvest of reform. With this din of opinion and debate, there was a keener scrutiny of institutions and domestic life than any we had known. There was sincere protesting against existing evils, and there were changes of employment dictated by conscience. No doubt, there was plentiful vaporing, and cases of black sliding might occur. But in each of these movements emerged a good result, a tendency to the adoption of similar methods, and an assertion of the sufficiency of the private man. Thus it was directly in the spirit and genius of the age. What happened in one instance, when a church censored and threatened to excommunicate one of its members on account of the somewhat hostile part to the churches, which his conscience led him to take in the anti-slavery business, the threatened individual immediately immediately excommunicated the church in a public and formal process. This has been several times repeated. It was excellent when it was done the first time, but of course loses all value when it is copied. Every project in the history of reform, no matter how violent and surprising, is good when it is the dictate of a man's genius and constitution but very dull and suspicious when adopted from another. It is right and beautiful in any man to say, I will take this coat or this book or this measure of corn of yours in whom we see the act to be original and so flow from the whole spirit and faith of him. For then that taking will have a given, a giving as free and divine. But we are very easily disposed to resist the same generosity of speech when we miss originally when we miss originality and truth to character in it. There was in all the practical activities of New England for the last quarter of a century a gradual withdrawal of tender consciences from the social organization. There is observable throughout the contest between mechanical and spiritual methods but with a steady tendency of a thoughtful and virtuous to a deeper belief and reliance on spiritual facts. In politics, for example, it is easy to see the progress of dissent. The country is full of rebellion. The country is full of kings. Hands off! Let there be no control and no interference in the administration of the affairs of this kingdom of me. Hence, the growth of the doctrine and of the party of free trade and the willingness to try that experiment in the face of what appear incontestable facts. I confess the motto of the Globe newspaper is so attractive to me that I can seldom find much appetite to read what is below in its columns. Quote, the world is governed too much, end quote. So the country is frequently affording solitary examples of resistance to the government. Solitary nullifiers who throw themselves on their reserve rights. Nay, who have reserved all their rights? Who reply to the assessor and to the clerk of court that they do not know the state and embarrass the courts of law by non juring and the commander-in-chief of the militia by non-resistance. The same disposition to scrutiny and dissent appeared in civil 
festive neighborly and domestic society. A restless prying. Conscientious criticism broke out in unexpected quarters. Who gave me the money with which I bought my coat? Why should professional labor and that of the counting house be paid so disproportionately to the labor of the porter and wood sawyer? This whole business of trade gives me to pause and think as it constitutes false relations between men. Inasmuch as I am prone to count myself relieved of my responsibility to behave well and nobly to that person whom I pay with money. Whereas if I had not that commodity, I should be put on my good behavior in all companies. And man would be a benefactor to man. As being himself, his only certificate that he had a right to those aids and services which each asked of the other. Am I not too, pro too protected a person? Is there not a wide disparity between the lot of me and the lot of thee, my poor brother, my poor sister? Am I not defrauded of my best culture and the loss of these gymnastics? which manual labor and emergencies of poverty cons constitute, I find nothing helpful and ex or exalting in the smooth conventions of society. I do not like the close ear of saloons. I begin to suspect myself to be a prisoner, though treated with all this courtesy and luxury. I pay a destructive tax in my conformity. The same insatiable criticism may be traced in the efforts for the reform of education. The popular education has been taxed with a want of truth and nature. It was complained that an education to things was not given. We are students of, wood, of words. We are shut up in schools and colleges and recitation rooms for 10 or 15 years and come out at last with a bag of wind and memory of words and do not know a thing. We cannot use our hands, or our legs, or our eyes, or our arms. We do not know an edible root in the woods. We cannot tell our course by the stars, nor the hour of the day by the sun. It is well if we can swim and skate. We are afraid of a horse and a cow, of a dog of a snake, of a spider. The Roman rule was to teach a boy nothing that he could not learn standing. The old English rule was all summer in the field and all winter in the study. And it seemed as if man should learn to plant or to fish or to hunt, that he might secure his substance at all events and not be painful to his friends and fellow men. The lessons of science should be experimental also. The sight of a planet through a telescope is worth all the course on astronomy. The shock of the electric spark in the elbow outvalues all the theories. The taste of the nitrous oxide, the taste of the nitrous oxide, the firing of an artificial volcano are better than volumes of chemistry. One of the traits of the new spirit is the Inquisition it fixed on our scholastic devotion to the dead languages. Acts the ancient languages with great beauty of structure contain wonderful remains of genius which draw and always will draw certain like-minded men, Greek men and Roman men in all countries to the study. But by a wonderful drowsiness of usage, that exact the study of all men. Once, say two centuries ago, Latin and Greek had a strict relation to all the science and culture there was in Europe, and the mathematics had a momentary importance at some era of activity in physical science. These things became stereotyped as education, as the matter of manner of men it of men is, but the good spirit never cared for the colleges 
and though all men and boys were now drilled in Latin, Greek, and mathematics, and had quite left these shells high and dry on the beach, and was now creating and feeding other matters at other ends of the world. But in a hundred high schools and colleges, this warfare against common sense still goes on. Four or six or ten years. The pupil is parsing Greek and Latin. And as soon as he leaves the university, as it is ludicrously styled, he shuts these, those books for the last time. Some thousands of young men are graduated at our colleges and this community every year. And the persons who at 40 years still read Greek can all be counted on your hand. I never met with 10. Four or five persons I have seen who read Plato. But it is not, but is not this absurd that the whole liberal talent of this country should be directed in its best years on studies which lead to nothing? What was the consequence? Some intelligent person said or thought, is that Greek and Latin some spell to conjure, conjure with and not words of reason? If the physician, if the physician, the lawyer, the divine never use it to come at their ends, I need never learn it to come at mine. Conjuring is gone out of fashion. And I will omit this conjugate gating and so and go straight to affairs. So they jump the Greek and Latin and read law, medicine or sermons without it. To, my, to the astonishment of all, the self-made men took even ground at once with the oldest of the regular graduates. And in a few months, the most conservative circles of Boston and New York had quite forgotten who of their gownsmen were college-bred and who was not. Our tendency appears alike in the philosophical speculation. And in the rudest demo democra democratical movements, through all the petulance and all the puerility, the wish, namely, to cast aside the superflu superfluous and arrive at short methods, urged, as I suppose, by an intuition that the human spirit is equal to all emergencies alone. And that man is more often injured than helped by the means he uses. I conceive this gradual casting off of material aids and the indication of growing trust and the private self supply powers of the individual to be the affirmative principle of the recent philosophy, and that it is feeling its own profound truth and is reaching forward at this very hour to the happiest conclusions. I readily concede that in this, as in every period of intellectual activity, there has been a noise of denial and protest. Much was to be resisted, much was to be got rid of by those who were re reared in the old before they could begin to affirm and deconstruct. Many a reform of parishes in his removal of rubbish. And that makes offensiveness of the class. They are partial. They're not equal to the work they pretend. They lose their way in the salt on the kingdom of darkness. They expend all their energy on some accidental level and lose their sanity and power of benefit. It is of little moment that one or two or twenty errors of our social system be corrected, but of much that the man be in his senses. Criticism and attack on institutions, which we have witnessed, has made one thing plain, that society gains nothing, whilst a man, not himself, renovated, attempts to renovate things around him. He has become tediously good in some particular, but negligent or narrow in the rest. And hypocrisy and vanity are often the disgusting result. It is handsomer to remain in the establishment, better than the establishment. 
and conduct that it that in the best manner than to make a sally against evil by some single improvement without supporting it by a total regeneration. Do not be so vain of your one subjugation. Do you think there is only one? Alas, my good friend, there is no part of society or of life better than any other part. All our things are right and wrong together. The wave of evil washes all our institutions alike. Do you complain of our marriage? Our marriage is no worse than our education, our diet, our trade, our social customs. Do you complain of the laws of property? It is a pedantry to give much importance to them. Can we not play the game of life with these with these counters as well as with those in the institution of property as well as out of it? Let into it the new and renewing principle of love and, and property will be universality. No one gives the impression of superiority to the institution, which he must give who will reform it. It makes no difference what you say. You must make me feel what you are aloof. It makes no difference what you say. You must make me feel that you are aloof from it. By your natural and supernatural advantages, do easily see to the end of it. Do see how man can do without it. Now all men are on one side. No man deserves to be hurt against property. Only love, only an idea, is against property as we hold it. I cannot afford to be irritable and captious, nor to waste all my time in attacks. If I should go out of the church, if I should go out of church whenever I hear a full sentiment, I can never stay there five minutes, but why come out? The street is as false as the church. And when I get to my house, or to my manners, or to my speech, I have not got away from the lie. When we see an eager assailant of one of these wrongs, a special reformer, we feel like asking him. What right have you, sir, to your one virtue? Is virtue piecemeal? This is a jewel amidst the, ra the rags of a beggar. In another way, the right will be vindicated. In the midst of abuses, in the heart of cities, in the aisles of false churches, alike in one place and in another, wherever, namely, a just and heroic soul finds itself. There it will do what is next at hand, and by the new quality of character it shall put forth, it shall abrogate that old condition, law, or school in which it stands, before the law of its own mind. If partiality was one fault of the movement party, the other defect was the reliance on association. Doubts such as those I've intimate, intimated drove many good persons to agitate the questions of social reform. But the revolt against the spirit of commerce, the spirit of aristocracy, and the inveterate abuses of cities did not appear possible to individuals. And to do battle against numbers, they armed themselves with numbers. And against concert, they relied on new concert. Following or advancing beyond the idea of St. Simon, of Fourier and of Owen. These communities have already been formed in Massachusetts on kindred plans, and many more in the country at large. They aim to give every member a share in the manual labor, to give an equal reward to labor and to talent, and to unite a liberal culture with an education to labor. A scheme offers by the economies of associated labor and expense to make every member rich, on the same amount of property that, in separate families, would leave every member poor. The new associations are composed of men and women of superior talents and sentiments, yet it may 
easily be questioned whether such a community will draw, except in its beginning, the able and the good, whether those who have energy will not prefer the chance of superiority and power in the world to the humble certainties of association, whether such a retreat does not promise to become an asylum to those who have tried and failed, rather than a field to the strong, and whether the members will ne not necessarily be fractions of men, because he each finds that he cannot enter it without some compromise. Friendship and association are very fine things, and I grant Phalanx of the best of the human race, handed for some Catholic object. Yes, excellent. But remember that no society can ever be so large as one man. He and his friendship and his natural and momentary associations doubles or multiplies himself. But in the hour in which he mortgages himself to two or ten or twenty, he dwells himself below the stature of one. But the men of less faith could not thus believe, and to such concert appears soul specific of strength. I have failed, and you have failed, but perhaps together we shall not fail. Our housekeeping is not satisfactory to us, but perhaps a phalanx, a community might be. Many of us have deferred an opinion, and we could find no man who could make the truth plain, but possibly a colleague or an, an ecle ecclesiastical council might. I have not been able to either persuade my brother or to prevail on myself to disuse the traffic or the potation of brandy, but perhaps a pledge of total abstinence might effectively restrain us. May, might effectually restrain us. The candidate my party votes for is not to be trusted with a dollar. But he'll be honest in the Senate, for we can bring public opinion to bear on him. Thus concert was the specific in all cases. But concert is neither better nor worse, neither more nor less potent than individual force. All the men in the world cannot make a statue walk and speak cannot make a drop of blood or a blade of grass any more than one man can. But let it be one man. Let it be truth in two men, in ten men, then it's concert for the first time possible. Because the force which moves the world is a new quality and can never be furnished by adding whatever quantities of a different kind. What is the use of the concert of the false and the disunited. There can be no concert in two, where there is no concert in one. When an individual is not individual, but is dual, when his thoughts look one way and his actions another, when his faith is traversed by habits, when his will enlightened by reason is warped by his sense, when one hand he rows and with the other backs water, what concert can be. I do not wonder at the interest these projects inspire. The world is awakening to the idea of union, and these experiments show what is what it is thinking of. It is and will be magic. Men will live and communicate and plow and reap and govern as by aided ethereal power. When once they are united, as in a celebrated experiment, by expiration and respiration, exactly together, four persons lift a heavy man from the ground by the little finger only and without sense of weight. But this union must be inward and not one of covenants, and it is to be reached by a traverse of the methods they use. The union is only perfect when. All the uniters are isolated. It is a union of friends who live in difficult streets or towns. Each man, if he attempts to join himself to others, is on all sides cramped and diminished of his proportion. 
and the stricter and the stricter the union, the smaller and the more pitiful he is. But leave him alone to recognize in every hour and place the secret soul. He will go up and down, doing the works of a true member, and to the astonishment of all, the work will be done with concert, though no man spoke. Government will be adamantine without, a gov without any governor. The union must be ideal and actual individualism. I pass to the indication in some particulars of that faith in man, which the heart is preaching to us in these days, and which engages in more regard for the consideration that the speculations of one generation are the history of the next following. In alluding just how in alluding just now to our system of education, I spoke of the deadness of details. But it is open to graver criticism than the policy of its members. It is a system of despair. The disease with which the human mind now labors is want or fa of faith. Men do not believe in a power of education. We do not think we can speak to divine sentiments in man. And we do not try. We renounce all high aims. We believe that the defects of so many perverse and so many frivolous people who make up society are organic, and society is a hospital of incurables. A man of good sense, but of little faith, whose compassion seemed to lead him to church as often as he went there, said to me that, quote, he liked to have concerts and fears and churches and other public amusements go on. End quote. I'm afraid the remark is too honest and comes from the same origin of the maxim of the tyrant. Quote, if you would rule the world quietly, you must keep it amused. End quote. I noticed too that the ground on which eminent public servants urge the claims of popular education is fear. This country is filling up with the thousands and millions of voters. And you must educate them to keep them from our throats. We do not believe that any education, any system of philosophy, any influence of genius will ever give depth of insight to a superficial mind. Having settled ourselves in the infidelity, our skill is expended to procure alleviations, diversion, opiates. We adorn the victim with manual skill, his tongue with languages, his body with inoffensive and comely manners. So have we cunningly hid the tragedy of limitation and in a death we cannot avert? It is strange that society should be devoured by a secret melancholy which breaks through all its smiles and all its gaiety and games. But even one step farther, our infidelity has gone. It appears that some doubt is felt by good and wise men. Whether really the happiness and probity of men is increased by the culture of the mind, in those disciplines to which we give the name of education, unhappy too, the doubt comes from scholars, from persons who have tried these methods. In their experience, the scholar was not raised by the sacred thoughts amongst which he dwelt, but he used them to selfish ends. He was a prof profane person and became a showman, turning his gift to a remarkable use and not to his own sustenance and growth. It was found that the intellect could be independently developed, that is, in separation from the man, as any single as any single organ can be invigorated, and the result was monstrous. A canine, a canine appetite for knowledge was generated, which must still be fed, but was never satisfied. And this knowledge, not being directed on action, 
never took the character of substantial human truth, humane truth. Blessing those whom it entered, it gave the scholar certain power of expression, the power of speech, the power of poetry, a literary art. But it did not bring him to peace or to beneficence. When the literary class betray a destitution of faith, it is not strange that society should be disheartened and centralized by unbelief. What remedy? Life must be lived on a higher plane. We must go to a higher platform to which we are always invited to ascend. There, the whole aspect of things changes. I resist the skepticism of our education and to our educated men. I do not believe that the differences of opinion and character in men are organic. I do not recognize, beside the class of the good and the wise, a permanent class of skeptics or a class of conservatives or of malig malignants or materialists. I do not believe in two classes. You remember the story of the poor woman who importuned King Philip of Macedon to grant her justice, which Philip refused. The woman exclaimed, quote, I appeal. End quote. The king, astonished, asked to whom she appealed. The woman replied, quote, From Philip drunk to Philip sober. End quote. The text will suit me very well. I believe not in two classes of men, but in men in two moods, and Philip drunk and Philip sober. I think according to the good-hearted word of Plato, quote, unwillingly, the soul is deprived of truth, end quote. I am conservative miser, or thief. No man is but a supposed necessity which he tolerates by shortness or torpidity of sight. So lets no man go without some visitations and holidays of the Divine Presence. It would be easy to show by a narrow scanning of any man's biography that we are not so wedded to our paltry performances of every kind, but that every man has at intervals the grace to scorn his performances. In comparing them with his beliefs of what he should do, that he puts himself on the side of his enemies listening gladly to what they say of him, and accusing himself of the same things. What is it men love of genius, but its infinite hope, which degrades all it has done? Genius counts all its miracles, poor and short. Its own idea is never executed. The Iliad, the Hamlet, the Doric Column, the Roman Arch, the Gothic minister, the Gothic minster, the German anthem. When they are ended, the master casts behind him. How sinks the song in the waves of melody, which the universe pours over his soul. Before that gracious infinite out of which he drew these few strokes, how mean they look to the praises of the world attend them though the praises of the world attend them. From the triumphs of his art, he turns with desire to his greater defeat. Let those admire who will. With silently joy, he sees himself to be capable of a beauty that eclipses all which his hands have done, all which human hands have ever done. Well, we are, the ch we are all the children of genius, children of virtue, and feel their inspirations in our happier hours. Is not every man sometimes a radical in politics? Men are conservatives when they are least vigorous, when they are most luxurious. They're conservative after dinner or before taking their rest. When they are sick or aged in the morning or when their intellect or their conscience has been aroused, when they hear music or when they read poetry, they are radicals. In the circle of the rankest Tories that can be collected in England, 
old or new. Let a powerful and stimulating intellect, a man of great heart and mind, act on them. And very quickly these frozen conserv conservative conservators will yield to the friendly influence. These hopeless will begin to hope. These haters will begin to love. These immovable statues will begin to spin and revolve. I cannot help recall. I cannot help recalling the fine anecdote which Wharton relates to Bishop Berkeley when he was preparing to leave England with his plan of planting the gospel among the American savages. Lord Bathurst told me that the members of the Scribal, the Scribalerus Club, being met at his house at dinner, they agreed to rally Berkeley was also his guest on a scheme at Bermudas. Berkeley, having listened to the many lively things they had to say, begged to be heard in his turn, and displayed his plan with some astonishing and animating force of eloquence and enthusiasm that they would stuck they were struck dumb. And after some pause rose up all together with earnestness, exclaiming let us set out with him immediately. Men in all ways are better than they seem. They like flattery for the moment, but they know the truth for their own. It is a foolish cowardice which keeps us from trusting them and speaking to them rude truth. They resent your honesty for an instant. They will thank you for it always. What is it? We heartily wish of each other. Is it to be pleased and flattered? No. But to be convicted and exposed. To be ashamed out of our nonsense of all kinds. And made men of instead of ghosts and phantoms. We are weary of gliding ghost-like to the world. Which is itself so slight and unreal. We crave a sense of reality though it comes in strokes of pain. I explain so by this manlike love of truth, those excesses and errors in which, into which souls of greater of great vigor but not equal insight often fall. They feel the poverty at the bottom of all the seeming affluence of the world. They know the speed with which they come straight through the thin masquerade and can see their disgust at the indigence of nature. Ruzio, Mirabio, Charles Fox, Napoleon Byron, and I could easily add names nearer home of raging riders who drive their steeds so hard in the violence of living to forget its illusion. They would know the worst and tread the floors of hell. The heroes of ancient and modern fame Kimin, Themistocles, Alcibiades, Alexander, Caesar, have treated life and fortunes as a game to be well and skillfully played, but the stake not to be so valued, but at any time it could be held as a trifle light as ear and thrown up. Caesar, just before the Battle of Pharsalia, Discourse with the Egyptian priests concerning the fountains of the Nile, and offers to quit the army, the empire, and Cleopatra, if he will show him those mysterious sources. The same magnanimity, the same magnanimity shows itself in our social relations, in the, perf in the preference, namely, which each man gives to the society of superiors over that of his equals. All that a man has will he give for right relations with his mates. All that he has will he give for an erect, erect demeanor in every company and on each occasion. He aims at such things as his neighbor's prize and gives his days and nights his talents and his heart to strike a good stroke to acquit himself in all men's sight as a man. The consideration of an eminent citizen of a noted merchant, of a man of mark in his profession, a naval and military honor, a general's commission, a marshal's baton, 
a duckle coronet. A duckle coronet. The Laurel Poets and Anyhow Procured. The acknowledgement of eminent merit had this lost for each candidate that they enabled him to walk erect and unashamed in the presence of some persons before whom he felt himself inferior. Having raised himself to, the, to this rank, having established his equality with class after class of those with whom he would live well, he still finds certain others before whom he cannot possess himself because they have somewhat fairer, somewhat grander, somewhat purer, which extorts homage of him. And his ambition, is his ambition pure? Then will his laurels and his possessions seem worthless? Instead of avoiding these men who make his fine gold dim, he will cast all behind him, seek their society only. Woe and embrace this, his humiliation and mortification. Until he shall know why his eye sinks. His voice is husky. And his brilliant talents are paralyzed. In this presence. He is sure that the soul which gives a lie to all things. Will tell none. His constitution will not mislead him. If it cannot carry itself as it ought. High and unmatchable. In the presence of any man. If the secret oracles whose whisper makes the sweetness and dignity of his life, do here withdraw and accompany him no longer. It is time to undervalue what he has valued, to dispossess himself, to dispossesses himself of what he has acquired, and with Caesar to take in his hand the army, the empire and Cleopatra, and say, quote, All these will I relinquish, if you will show me the fountains of the Nile. End quote. Dear to, to, sorry. Dear to us are those who love us. The swift moments we spend with them are a compensation for a great deal of misery. They enlarge our life. But dear are those who reject us as unworthy. For they add another life. They build a heaven before us whereof we had not dreamed, and thereby supply to us new powers out of the recesses of the spirit, and urge us to new and attempt, unattempted performances. As every man at heart wishes the best, and not inferior society, wishes to be convicted of his error, and to come to himself, so he wishes that the same healing should not stop in his thought. But should penetrate his will or active power. The selfish man suffers more from his selfishness than he from whom the selfishness withholds. It's an important benefit. What he most wishes is to be lifted to some higher platform. That he may see beyond his present fear the trans-alpine good so that his fear, his coldness, his custom may be broken up like fragments of ice, melted and carried away in the great stream of goodwill. Do you ask my aid? I also wish to be a benefactor. I wish more to be a benefactor and servant than you wish to be served by me. And surely the greatest good fortune that could befall me it's precisely to be moved by you that I should say, take me and all mine and use me and mine freely to your ends. For I could not say it otherwise than because a great enlargement had to come to my heart and mind, which made me superior to my fortunes. Here we are paralyzed with fear. We hold on to our little properties, house and land. Offer some money for the bread which they have in our experience yielded us. Although we confess that our being does not flow through them, we desire to be made great. We desire to be touched with that fire which shall command this ice to stream and make our existence a benefit. 
If therefore we start objections to your project, O friend of the slave, O friend of the poor, or of the race, understand well that it is because we wish to drive you, to drive us into your measures. We wish to hear ourselves confu confuted. We are haunted with a belief that you have a secret, which it would highliest advantage us to learn, and we would force you to impart it to us. Though it should bring us to prison or to worse extremity. Nothing shall warp me from the brief, I beg your pardon, nothing should warp me from the belief that every man is a lover of truth. There's no pure lie, no pure malignity in nature. The entertainment of the proposition of depravity is, alas, pro profligacy. I'm going to repeat that word, proflig. Uh, profligacy. Yeah, I think that's right. And profan profan profanation. There's no skepticism, no atheism, but that could it be received into common belief. Suicide would unpeople the planet. It has had a name to live in some dogmatic theology. But each man's innocence and his real liking of his neighbor have kept it a dead letter. I remember standing at the polls one day when the anger of the political contest gave a certain grimness to the faces of the independent electors. And a good man at my side, looking at the people, remarked, I am satisfied that the largest part of these men on either side you mean to vote right? End quote. I suppose considerate observers looking at the masses of men in the blameless and in the equivoc equivocal actions will assent that in spite of selfishness and frivolity, the general purpose in a great number of persons is fidelity. The reason why any one refuses his assent to your opinion or his aid to your benevolent design, is in you. He refuses to accept you as a bringer of truth. Because though you think you have it, he feels that you have it not. You have not given him the authentic sign. If it were truth, while well, to run into the details, this general doctrine of latent, but ever soliciting spirit, it would be easy to adduce illustration in particulars of a man's equality to the church, of his equality to the state, and his equality to every other man. It is yet in all men's memory that a few years ago, the liberal churches explained that the Calvinistic church denied to them the name of Christian. I think the complaint was confession. A religious church would not complain. A religious man like Beeman, Fox of Swedenborg, is not irritated by wanting the sanction of the church, but the church feels the accusation of his presence and belief. It only means that a just man should walk in our streets to make it appear how pitiful and inartificial a contrivance is our legislation. The man whose part is taken and who does not want for society, does not wait for society in anything, has a power which society cannot choose but feel. The familiar experiment called the hydrostatic paradox in which a capillary column of water balances the ocean as a symbol of the relation of one man to the whole family of men. The wise Dandamans, on hearing the lives of Socrates, Pythagoras, and Di Diogenes, read, quote, Judge them to be great men every way. 
accepting that they were too much subjected to the reverence of the laws, which is second and authorized, true virtue must abate, very much of its original vigor, end quote. And as a man is equal to the church and equal to the state, so he is equal to every other man. The disparities of power and men are superficial. And all frank and searching conversation, in which a man lays himself open to his brother, apprises each of their radical unity. When two persons sit and converse in a thoroughly good understanding, the remark is sure to be made. See how we have disputed about words? Let a clear apprehensive mind, such as every man knows among his friends, converse with the most commanding poetic genius. I think it would appear that there was no inequality, such as men fancy, between them, that a perfect understanding, a like receiving, a like perceiving, abolished differences. And the poet would confess that his creative imagination gave him no deep advantage, but only the superficial one that he could express himself and the other could not. That his advantage was a knack, which might impose on indolent men, but cannot impose on lovers of truth. For they know the tax of talent. Or oh, a price of greatness, the power of expression to orphan pays. I believe it is the conviction of the purest men that the net amount of man and man does not much vary. Each is incomparably superior to his companion in some faculty. His want of skill in another direction has added to his fitness for his own work. Each seems to have compensation yielded to him by his infirmity. And every hindrance operates as a con concentration of his force. These and like experiences intimate the man stands in strict connection with a higher fact never yet manifested. There's power over and behind us, and we are the channels of his communications. We seek to say thus and so, and over our head some spirits sit, which contradicts what we say. We would persuade our fellow to this or that. Another self within our eyes dissuades him. That which we keep back this reveals. In vain we compose our faces and our words. It holds uncontrollable communication with the enemy. And he answers civilly to us, but believes the spirit. We exclaim, There's a traitor in the house. But at last it appears that he is, he is the true man, and I am the traitor. This open channel to the highest life is the first and last reality. So subtle, so quiet, yet so tenacious, that although I have never expressed the truth, and although I have never heard expression of it from any other, I know that the whole truth is here from me. What if I cannot answer your questions? I'm not pained that I cannot frame a reply to the question. What is the operation we call providence? There lies the unspoken thing, present omnipresent. Every time we converse, we seek to translate it into speech. But whether we hit or whether we miss, we have the fact. Every discourse is an approximate answer. But it is of small consequence that we do not get into verbs and nouns, while it abides for contemplation forever. If the auguries of the prophesying heart shall make themselves good in time, the man who shall be born whose advent men and events prepare and for sure and for show is one who shall enjoy his connection with a higher life. With the man within man shall destroy distrust by his trust, shall use his native but forgotten methods, shall not take counsel of flesh and blood, but shall rely on the law alive and beautiful which works over our heads and under our feet. Pitiless. It avails itself of our success when we obey it and of our ruin when we contravene it. Men are all secret believers in it, else the word justice would have no meaning. They believe 
that the best is the true, that right is done at last, O oh, chaos will come. It rewards actions after their nature and not after the design of the agent. Work, it saith to man, and every hour, paid or unpaid, see only that thou work, and thou canst not escape the reward. Whether thy work be fine or coarse, planting corn or writing epics, so only it be honest, work done to thine own approbation. It shall earn a reward to the senses as well as to the thought. No matter how often defeated, you are born to victory. The reward of a thing well done is to achieve, is to have done it. As soon as a man is wanted to look beyond surfaces and to see how this high will prevails without an exception or an interval, interval, he settles himself in the serenity. He can already rely on the laws of gravity that every stone will fall where it is due. The good globe is faithful and carries us securely to the celestial spaces, anxious, resigned. We need not interfere to help it on. And he will learn one day the mild lesson they teach that our own orbit is all our task. And we need not assist the administration of the universe. Do not be so impatient to set the town right concerning the unfounded, unfounded pretensions and the false reputation of certain men of standing. They are laboring harder to set the town right concerning themselves and will certainly succeed. Suppress for a few days your criticism on the insufficiency of this or that teacher or experimenter and he will have demonstrated his insufficiency to all men's eyes. In like manner, let a man fall into the divine circuits, and he is enlarged. Obedience to his genius is the only liberating influence. We wish to escape from subject, from subjection and a sense of inferiority, and we make self-denying ordinances. We drink water. We eat grass. We refuse the laws. We go to jail. It is all in vain, only by obedience to his genius, only by the freest activity and the way constitutional to him. Does an angel seem to arise before a man and lead him by the hand out of all the wards of the prison? That which befits us, embosomed in beauty and wonder as we are, is cheerfulness and courage and endeavor to realize our aspirations. The life of man is the true romance which when it is v valiantly conducted will yield imagination a higher joy than any fiction. All around us, where power are wrapped up under the coarse mattings of custom and all wonder prevented, it is so wonderful to our neurologists that a man can see without his eyes. That it does not occur to them that it is just a wonderful, it is just as wonderful that he should see with them and that it is, sorry, and that is ever the difference between the wise and the unwise. The latter wonders at what is unusual. The wise man wonders at the usual. Shall not the heart which has received so much trust the power by which it lives? May it not quit other leadings and listen to the soul? that has guided it so gently and taught it so much, secure that the future will be worthy of the past. We are currently on page... What page are we on? That was page 468. Obviously in the PDF pages it's 460. We've just finished page 468 and we shall now carry on the next essay, which I believe is 470 really, no, it's 469, 469, Plato or the Philosopher. This essay, like the one that jellows it, is from representative men which was published in 1850. Chapters in that book were originally given as a series of lectures in Boston 
1845 to 1846 and were delivered before the Manchester Athenaeum in England in 1847 and 48. The chapters not included in this volume are use are quote uses of great men end quote Swedenborg or the mystic quote Montagin or the skeptic end quote quote shapes Shakespeare or the poet end quote and quote Goff or the writer end quote. Plato or the Philosopher Among secular books, Plato Let me repeat that. Among secular books, Plato only is entitled to Omar's fanatical compliment to the Quran. When he said, Burn the libraries. Quote, Burn the libraries for their value is in this book. End quote. These sentences contain the culture of nations. These are the cornerstone of schools. These are the fountain head of literature. A discipline is a discipline it is in logic, arithmetic, taste, symmetry, poetry, language, rhetoric, ontology, morals or practical wisdom. These were never such range of there was never such range of speculation. Out of Plato come all things that are still written and debated among men of thought. Great havoc makes he among our originalities. We have reached a mountain from which all these drift boulders were detached. Bible of the learned for twenty two hundred years. Every brisk young man who says in succession fine things to each reluctant generation. Both years, Rabelais, Erasmus, Bruno, Lucky, Roseo, Alfieri, Coleridge, is some reader of Plato, translating into the vernacular wittily his good things. Even the men of grander proportion suffer some deduction from the misfortune, shall I say, of coming after this exhausting generalizer. St. Augustine, Copernicus, Newton, Bohemian, Swedenborg, Goff, are likewise his debtors. I must say after him, for it is fear to credit the broadest generalizer of all the particulars Deductible from his thesis. Let me repeat that. For it is fair to credit the broadest generalizer of all the particulars deductible from his thesis. Plato's philosophy and philosophy, Plato at once the glory and the shame of mankind. And since neither Saxon no Roman have availed to add any idea to his categories. No wife, no children, had he. And the thinkers of all civilized nations are his posterity and are ting tinged with his mind. How many great men nature is incessantly sending up out of night to be his men, Platonists, Alexandrians, a constellation of genius. The Elizabethans, not less, Sir Thomas More, Henry More, John Hales, John Smith, Lord Beckham, Jeremy Taylor, Ralph Cudworth, Sydenham, Thomas Taylor, Marcellus Ficinus, and Picus. Me run dollar. Calvinism is in his fatal. Christianity 
is in it. Mahometanism draws all its philosophy in his handbook, in its handbook of morals. The Akalak Yai Jalai, Yai Akalak Yai Jalali from him. Mysticism finds in Plato all its texts. The citizen of a town in Greece is no villager nor patriot. An Englishman reads and says, How English! A German, how Teutonic! An Italian, how Roman and how Greek! I'm sorry if I put the last now wrong. As I say, that hell of August had the universal beauty that everybody felt related to her. So Plato seems to a reader in New England, an American genius. His broad humanity transcends all sectional lines. The stranger Plato instructs us what to think of the vexed question concerning his reputed works. What are genuine, what superior, what spurious. It is singular that whenever we find a man higher by a whole head than any of his contemporaries, it is sure to come into doubt what are his real works. Thus Hammer, Plato, Raphaela, Shakespeare, for these men magnetize their contemporaries so that their companies, so that their companions can do for them what they can never do for themselves. And the great man does thus live in several bodies and write or paint or act by many hands. And after some time, it is not easy to say what is the authentic work of the master and what is only of his school. Plato too, like every great man, consumed his own times. What is a great man but one of great affinities? Who takes up into himself all arts, sciences, all nobles as his food. He can spare nothing. He can dispose of everything. What is not good for virtue is good for knowledge. Hence his contemporaries, taxing with pla plagiarism. But the inventor only knows how to borrow. And society is glad to forget the innumerable laborers who ministered the architect and reserves all its gratitude for him. When we are praising Plato, it seems we are praising quotations from Solon and Sophora and Philolius. Be it so, every book is a quotation and every house is a quotation out of all forests and mines and stone quarries and every man is a quotation from his ancestors and this grasping inventor let me repeat that every book is a quotation and every house is a quotation out of all forests and mines and stone quarries and every man is a quotation from all his ancestors and this grasping inventor puts all nations under contribution Plato absorbed the learning of his times. Philolaus, Timaeus, Heraclitus, Parmendus, and what else? Then his master. Socrates, and finding himself still capable of a larger synthesis. Beyond all example, then or since he traveled into Italy to gain what Pythagoras had for him. Then into Egypt and perhaps still farther east to import the other element which Europe wanted. Into the European mind, this breadth entitles him to stand as a representative of philosophy. He says in the Republic, quote, such a genius as philosophers must of necessity have, is wont, but seldom in all its parts to meet the man, but its different parts generally spring up in different persons." End quote. Every man who would do anything well 
must come to it from a higher ground. A philosopher must be more than a philosopher. Plato is clothed with the power of a poet, stands upon the highest place of the poet. And though I doubt he wanted the decisive gift of lyric expression, mainly is not a poet because he chose to use the poetic gift to an ulterior purpose. Green geniuses have the shortest biographies. Their cousins can tell you nothing about them. They live in their writings and sell their house, and street life was trivial and commonplace. If you'd know the tastes and complexions, the most admiring of their readers most resembles them. Plato especially has no external biography. If he had lover, wife, or children, we had nothing of them. He ground them all into paint. As a good chimney burns in smoke, so a philosopher converts the value of all his fortunes into his intellectual performances. Let me repeat that. As a good chimney burns in smoke, so a philosopher converts the value of all his fortunes into his intellectual performances. He was born 427 BC, about the time of death of Pericles, was of patrician connection. In his times in the city, and is said to have had an early inclination for war, but in his 20th year meeting with Socrates, was easily dissuaded from his pursuit and remained for 10 years his scholar until the death of Socrates. He then went to Megara, accepted the invitations of Dion and of Dion Yaisios to the court of Sicily and went th thither three times, though very capriciously related, which very capriciously treated. He traveled into Italy, then into Egypt, where he stayed a long time. Some say three, some say 13 years. It is said he went farther into Babylonia. And this, Babylonia, this is uncertain. Returning to Athens, he gave lessons in the academy to those whom his fame drew thither and died as we have received it. An act of writing at 81 years, but the biography of Plato is interior. We ought to account for the supreme elevation of this man in the intellectual history of our race. How it happens that in proportion to the culture of men, they become his scholars. That as our Jewish Bible has implanted itself in the table talk and household life of every man and woman in the European and American nations, so the writings of Plato have preoccupied every school of learning, every lover of thought, every church, every poet, making it impossible to think on certain levels except through him. He stands between the truth and every man's mind and has almost impressed language and the primary forms of thought with his name and seal. I am struck in reading him with extreme with extreme modernness of his style and spirit. Here is a germ of the Europe. Here is the germ of that Europe we know so well. In its long history of arts and arms, there are all here are all its traits already discernible in the mind of Plato and in none before him. It has spread itself since into a hundred histories. but has added no new element. This perpetual modernness is the measure of merit in every work of art, since the author of it was not misled by anything short-lived or local, but abode by real and abiding traits. How Plato came thus to be Europe, and philosophy, and almost literature, is the problem to solve. This con could not have happened without a sound sincere and Catholic man, able to honor at the same time the ideal 
or laws of the mind and fate, or the order of nature, the first period of a nation as of an individual, is the period of unconscious strength. Children cry, scream and stamp with fury, unable to express their desires. As soon as they can speak and tell their want and the reason of it, they become gentle. In adult life, whilst the perceptions are obtuse, men and women talk vehemently and and superlatively, blunder and quarrel. The manners are full of description. Of, the manners are full of desperation. Their sp- speech is full of oaths. As soon as, with culture, things are cleared up a little, and they see them no longer in lumps and masses, but accurately dis- distributed. They these they desist from that weak vehemence, and explain their meaning in detail. If a tongue has not been framed for articulation, man would still be a beast in the forest. The same weakness and want on a higher plane occurs daily in the education of ardent young men and women. Ah, you don't understand me? I've never met with anyone who comprehends me. And they sigh and weep, write verses and walk alone, fall to power to express their precise meaning. In a month or two, through the favor of their good genius, they meet someone so related as to assist their volcanic estate. And good communication being once established, they are thenceforth they are thence forward good citizens. It is ever thus. The progress is to accuracy, to skill, to truth, from blind force. There is a moment in the history of every nation when proceeding out of this brute youth, the perceptive, the perceptive powers reach their ripeness and have not yet become microscopic. So that man at that instant extends across the entire scale. And with his feet still planted on the immense forces of night, converses by his eyes and brain with solar and stellar creation. That is the moment of adult health, the culmination of power. Such is the history of Europe in all points, and such in philosophy. Its early records, almost perished, are of the immigrations from Asia, bringing with them the dreams of barbarians. A confusion of crude notions of morals and of natural philosophy, gradually subsiding through the partial insight of single teachers. Before Pericles came the seven wise masters, and we have the beginners of geometry, metaphysics, and ethics. Then the particulars, deducing the origin of things from flux or water, or from air, or from fire, or from mind, all mix with these causes mythologic pictures. Alas, comes Plato, the distributor, who needs no barbaric paint, or tattoo, or whooping, for he can define. He leaves with Asia, the vast and superlative. He is a rival of accuracy and intelligence. Quote, He shall be as a god to me who can rightly divide and define. End quote. This defining is philosophy. Philosophy is the account which the human mind gives to itself of the constitution of the world. Two cardinal facts lie forever at the base, the one and the two. One unity of one unity or identity and two variety. We unite all things by perceiving the law which pervades them, by perceiving the superficial differences and the profound resemblances. But every mental act, this very perception of identity or oneness, recognizes the differences, recognizes the difference of things, oneness and otherness. It is impossible to speak or to think without embracing both. The mind is urged to ask for one cause of many effects. 
then for the cause of that, and again the cause. Diving still into the profound, self-assured, that it shall arrive at an absolute and sufficient one. In one, that shall be all. Quote, In the midst of the sun is the light. In the midst of the light is truth. And in the midst of truth is the imperishable being. End quote. Say the Vedas. All philosophy of East and West has the same centerpiece, urged by an opposite necessity. The mind turns from the one to that which is not one. But other, or many, from cause to effect, and affirms the necessary existence of variety, the self-existence of both, and each is involved in the other. These strictly blended elements, it is the problem of thought to separate and to reconcile. These strictly blended elements, it is a problem of thought to separate and to reconcile. Their existence is mutually contradictory and exclusive. And each so fast slides into the other that we can never say what is one and what it is not. The Proteus is as nimble in the highest as in the lowest grounds. When we contemplate the one, the true, the good, as in the surfaces and extremities of matter. In all nations there are minds which incline to dwell in the conception of the fundamental unity. The raptures of prayer and ecstasy of devotion lose all being into one being. This tendency finds its high expression in the religious writings of the East, and chiefly in the Indian scriptures in the Vedas, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Vishnu Purana. These writings contain little else than the, this idea, and they rise to pure and sublime strains in celebrating them. The same, the same, friend and foe, are of one stuff. The plowman, the plow and the furrow, are of one stuff. And the stuff is such and so much, that the variations of form are unimportant. Quote, you are fit, end quote, says the supreme Krishna to a sage. Quote, to apprehend that you are not distinct from me, that which I am thou art, and that also is this world, with his gods and heroes and mankind. Men contemplate distinctions because they are stupefied with ignorance. End quote. Quote, the words I and mine constitute ignorance. What is the great end of all? You shall now learn from me. It is so, one in all bodies, pervading uniform, perfect, preeminent over nature, exempt from birth, growth and decay, omnipresent, made up of true knowledge, independent, unconnected with unrealities, with name, species, and the rest, and time past, present, and to come. Knowledge that this spirit, which is essentially one, is in one own and in all other bodies, is the wisdom of one who knows the unity of things. As one diffusive ear, passing through the perforations of a flute is distinguished as the notes of his scale so the nature of the great spirit is single though its forms be manifold arising from consequences of acts and the difference of the investing form as that of God or the rest is destroyed there is no distinction quote, end quote. quote the whole world is but a manifestation of Vishnu who is identical with all things and is to be regarded by the wise as not differing from, but as the same as themselves. I neither am going nor coming, nor is my dwelling in any one place. Nor art thou thou, nor are others others, nor am I I. End quote. As if he had said, all is for the soul 
and the soul is Vishnu. And animals and stars are transient paintings, and light is whitewash, and durations are deceptive, and form is imprisonment. And heaven itself a decoy. That which a soul seeks is resolution into being above form, out of territories, and out of heaven, liberation from nature. A speculation tends us to a terrific a speculation tends us to a terrific unity in which all things are absorbed. Action tends directly backwards to diversity. The first is the course of gravitation of mind. The second is the power of nature. Nature is the manifold. The unity absorbs and melts or reduces. Nature opens and creates. These two principles reappear and interpretate all things, all thought. The one, the many. One is being, the other, intellect. One is necessity, the other, freedom. One rest, the other, motion. One power, the other, distribution. One strength, the other, pleasure. One consciousness, the other, definition. One genius, the other, talent. One earnestness, the other, knowledge. One possession, the other trade. One caste, or caste, the other culture. One king, the other democracy. And if we dare carry these generalizations a step higher and name the last tendency of both, we might say that the end of the one is escape from organization, pure science, and the end of the higher is the highest instrumentality or use of means or executive deity. I'm going to read. Read this again. This is profound. One is being, the other, intellect. One is necessity, the other, freedom. One, rest, the other, motion. One, power, the other, distribution. One, strength, the other, pleasure. One, consciousness, the other, definition. One genius, the other, talent. One earnestness, the other, knowledge. One possession, the other, trade. One case, the other, culture. One king, the other, democracy. And if we dare carry these generalizations a step higher and name the last tendency of both, we might say, that the end of the one is escape from organization, pure science, and the end of the other is the highest instrumentality, a use of means, or executive deity. Each student adheres by temperament and by habit to the first or the second of these gods of the mind. By religion he, tests, he tends to unity, by intellect or by the senses to the many, a too rapid unification and an excessive appliance to parts and particulars are the twin dangers of speculation. To this partiality, the history of nations corresponded. A country of unity, of immovable institutions, the seat of a philosophy, delighting in abstractions, of men faithful in doctrine and in practice, the idea of a deaf, unimplorable, immense faith is Asia. And it realizes this faith in the social institution of caste. On the other side, the genius of Europe is active and creative. It resists caste by culture. Its philosophy was a discipline. It is a land of arts, inventions, trade, freedom. If the East loved infinity, the West delighted in boundaries. European civility is the triumph of talent. The extension of system, the sharpened understanding, adaptive skill, delight in forms, delight in manifestation, incomprehensible results. Pericles, Athens, Greece had been working in this element with the joy of genius, not yet chilled by any foresight of the detriment of an excess.
They saw before them no sinister political economy, no ominous Malthus, no Paris or London, no pitiless subdivision of classes, the doom of the pinmakers, the doom of the weavers, of dressers, of, of stockingers, of carters, of spinners, of colliers. No Ireland, no Indian caste, no superinduced by the efforts of Europe to throw it off. The understanding was in its health and prime. Art was in its splendid novelty. They cut the pentelican marble as if it were snow. And the perfect works in architecture and sculpture seemed things of course, not more difficult than the completion of a new ship at the Medford Yards or new mills at Lowell. These things are in course and may be taken for granted. The Roman Legion, Byzantine legislation, English trade, and the Salon of Versailles, the cafes of Paris, the steam mill, steamboat, steam coach, may all be in perspective. The town meeting, the ballot box, the newspaper, and cheap press. Meantime, Plato, in Egypt and in Eastern pilgrimages, imbibe the idea of one deity, in which all things are absorbed, the unity of Asia and the detail of Europe. The infinitude of the Asias, Asias, the infinitude of the Asiatic soul, and the defining, result-loving machine-making, surface-making, upward going Europe, Plato came to join, and by contact, to enhance the energy of each. Excellence of Europe and Asia are in his brain. Metaphysics and natural philosophy expressed the genius of Europe. He substructs the religion of Asia as the base. In short, a balanced soul was born, perceptive of the two elements. It is an easy it is as easy to be great as to be small. The reason why we do not at once believe in admirable souls is because they are not in our experience. In actual life, they are so rare as to be incredible. But primarily, there is not only no presumption against them, but the strongest presumption in favor of their appearance. For whether voices were heard in the sky or not, whether his mother or father dreamed that the infant man-child was a son of a pole, whether a swarm of bees settled on his lips or not. A man who could see two sides of everything was born. The wonderful synthesis, so familiar in nature, the upper and the underside of the metal of Jove, the union of, the union of impossibilities which reappears in every object, its real and its ideal power, was now also transferred entire to the consciousness of a man. Balance all came. If he loved abstract truth, he saved himself by propounding the most popular of all principles. The absolute good which rules rulers and judges the judge. If he made transcendental distinctions, he fortifies himself by drawing all his illustrations from sources disdained by orators and polite conversers. From Marys and puppies, from pitchers and soup ladles, from cooks and criers, the shops of patters, horse doctors, butchers, and fishmongers. He cannot forgive in himself a partiality, but is resolved that the two poles of thought shall appear in his statement. His argument and his sentence are self-poised and spherical. The two poles appear, yes, and become two hands to grasp and appropriate their own. Every great artist has been such by synthesis. Our strength, is our strength is transitional, alterating, or shall I say, a thread of two strands. The seashore, sea seen from shore, shore seen from sea, the taste of two metals in contact, and our enlarged powers at the approach and at the departure of a friend. The experience of poetic creativeness, which is not found in staying at home, nor yet in traveling but in transitions from one to the other, which must therefore be adroitly managed 
to present as much transitional surface as possible. This command of two elements must explain the power and the charm of Plato. Art expresses the one or the same by the different. Thought seeks to know unity in unity. Poetry to show it by variety. That is, always been by an object or symbol. Plato keeps the two vases, one of ethereum and one of pigment, at a side, and invariably uses both. Things added to things as statistics. Civil history are inventories. inventories. Things used as language are inexhaustibly attractive. Plato turns incessantly the obverse and the reverse of the Medal of Jove. To take an example, the physical philosophers had sketched each his theory of the world. The theory of atoms, of fire, a flux of spirit. Theories mechanical and chemical in their genius. Plato, a master of mathematics, studious of all natural laws and causes, feels these as second causes to be no th theories of the world, but beer invent inventories and lists. To the study, to the study of nature, he gave quote, prefixes to the dogma. Quote, Let us declare the cause which led the supreme ordainer to protect and compose the universe. He was good, and he who is good has no kind of envy. Exempt from envy, he wished that all things should be as much as possible like himself. Whosoever taught by wise men shall admit this as the prime cause of the origin and foundation of the world, will be in the truth, end quote. Quote, all things are for the sake of the good, and it is the cause of everything beautiful, end quote. The dogma animates and impersonates his philosophy. The synthesis which makes the character of his mind appears in all his talents. Where there is great compass of wit, we usually find excellencies that combine easily in the living man, but in description appear incompatible. The mind of Plato is not to be exhibited by a Chinese catalogue, but is to be apprehended by an original mind in the exercise of its original power. And in the freest abandonment is united with the precision of a geometer. His daring imagination gives him the more solid grasp of facts. As the birds of higher flight have the strongest Alla bones. His patrician polished his intrinsic intrinsic elegance edge by an irony so subtle that it stings and paralyzes, adorn the soundest self and strength of frame. According to the old sentence, quote, If Jove should descend the earth, he would speak in the style of Plato. End quote. With his Palatial ear there is for the direct aim of several of his works, and running through the tenor of them all, of them all a certain earst, earnestness which mounts in the Republic and in the Phaedo to piety. He has been charged with finding sickness at the time of the death of Socrates, but the anecdotes that have come down from the times attest his manly interference from the people in his master's behalf. Since even the savage cry of the assembly to Plato is preserved, and the indignation towards popular government in many of his pieces expresses a personal exasperation, he has probity, a need of reverence for justice and honor, and the humanity which makes him tender for the superstitions of the people. Add to this, he believes that poetry Prophecy and the high insight are from a wisdom of which man is not master. Had the gods never philosophized, but by a celestial mania, these miracles are accomplished. Horse on these winged, ste winged steeds, he sweeps the dim regions, visits worlds with which flesh cannot enter. He saw the solemn pain, he hears the doom of the judge, he beholds the penal meta. Metamphysicosis, the fates with the rock and shears, and hears the intoxicating hum of the spindle. But a circum 
his circums I beg your pardon his circumspection never forsook him. One would say he has reached the inscription of the gates of Bazirain. Could behold, end quote. And on the second gate, quote, be bold, be bold, and everyone be bold, end quote. And again, and then again, had paused well at the third gate, quote, be not too bold, end quote. His strength is like the momentum of a falling planet, and his discretion, the return of its due, a perfect curve. So excellent is his Greek love of boundary and his skill in definition. In reading logarithms, one is not more secure than in following Plato in his flights. Nothing can be bolder than his head when the lightnings of his imagination are playing in the sky. He has finished his thinking before he brings it to the reader, and he abounds in the surprises of a literary master. He has the opulence with which furnishes, at every turn, the precise weapon he needs as a rich man wears no more garments, drives no more horses, sits in no more chambers than the poor, but has that one dress or equipage or instrument which is fit for the hour and the need. So Plato in his plenty is never restricted but has the fit word. There is indeed no weapon in all the armory of wit which he did not possess and use epic analysis, mania, intuition. Music, satire, and irony, down to the customary and polite. His illustrations are poetry and his just illustrations. Socrates' profession of Socrates' profession of obstetric art is good philosophy. And his finding that word quote cookery and quote and quote idolatry art and quote. For rhetoric, in the Gorgias, does use as a substantial service still. No orator can measure in effect with him who can give good nicknames. What moderation and understatement in checking his thunder in Mild Valley. He has good natur naturally furnish the courtier and citizen with all that can be said against the schools. Quote, For philosophy is an, is an elegant thing if one modestly meddles with it. But if he, conver he is conversant with it more than it's becoming, it corrupts the man. He, end quote. He could well afford to be generous. He who from the sunlight central centrality and reached the vision had a faith without cloud, such as his perception was his speech. He plays with the doubt and makes the most of it. He paints and quibbles, and by and by comes a sentence that moves the sea and land. The admirable earnest comes not only at intervals, and the perfect yes and no of the dialogue, but in bursts of light. Quote, I therefore... Calicles, and persuaded by these accounts, and consider how I may exhibit my soul before the judge in a healthy condition. Wherefore, disregarding the honors that most men value and looking to the truth, I shall endeavor in reality to live as virtuously as I can. And when I die, to die so, and invite all other men to the utmost of my power. And you too, I in turn invite to this contest, which I affirm surpasses all contests here. End quote. He is a great average man, one who to the best thinking adds a proportion and equality in his faculties. So the men see in him their own dreams and glimpses made available and made to pass for what they are. A great common sense is his warrant and qualification to be the world's interpreter. 
He has reason. And all the philosophic and poetic class have. But he has also what they have not. The strong solving sense to reconcile his poetry with the appearances of the world and build a bridge from the street of cities to the Atlantis. He omits never this graduation, but slopes his thought. However picturesque, the precipice, the precipice on one side to an access from the plain. He never writes in ecstasy or catches up into poetic raptures. Plato apprehended the cardinal facts. He could prostrate himself on the earth and cover his eyes, whilst he adored that which cannot be numbered or gorged or known or named, that of which everything can be affirmed and denied, that, quote, which is entity and non-entity, end quote. He called it superessential. He even stood ready, as in the parameters, par to demonstrate that it was so, that this being exceeds the limits of intellect. No man ever more fully acknowledged the ineffable, having paid his homage. As for the human race, to the illimitable, he then stood erect, and for the human race affirmed, and yet things are knowledgeable. That is, the age in his mind was first heartily honored. The ocean of love and power before form, before will, before knowledge. The same, the good, the one, and now refreshed and empowered by his worship. The instinct of Europe, namely culture, returns. And he cries, yet yeah, things are knowable. They are knowable because being from one thing, from one Things correspond. There is a scale, and the correspondence of heaven to earth, of matter to mind, of the part to the whole, is our guide. As there is a science of stars, called astronomy, a science of quantities, called mathematics, a science of qualities, called chemistry. So there is a science of, sci of sciences, I call it di dialectic, which is the intellect discriminating the false and the true. It rests on the observation of identity and diversity, for the judge is to unite to an object and notion which belongs to it. The sciences, even the best, ma the best mathematics and astronomy are like sportsmen, who sees whatever prey offers, even without being able to make any use of it. Dialectic must teach the use of them. Quote, this is of that rank, that no intellectual man will enter on any study for its own sake, but only with a view to advance himself in that one sole science which embraces all. End quote. Quote, the essence of... I beg your pardon. Quote, the essence or peculiarity of man is to comprehend the whole of that which is the diversity of sensations can be comprised under a rational unity, end quote. Quote, the soul which has never perceived the truth cannot pass into human form, end quote. I announce to men the intellect, I announce the good of being interpenetrated by the mind that made nature. This benefit, namely, that it can understand nature, which is made and maketh. Nature is good, but intellect is better. As the lawgiver is before the law receiver, I give you joy, O sons of men, that truth is altogether wholesome, that we have hope to search out what might be the very self of everything. The misery of man is to be balked by the sight of essence and to be stuffed with conjectures. But the supreme good is reality. The supreme beauty is reality. 
and all virtue and all felicity depend on the science of the real. For courage is nothing else than knowledge, Ma. For courage is nothing else than knowledge. The fierce fortune that can befall man is to be guided by his demon to that which is truly his own. This also is the essence of justice to attend everyone his own. May the notion of virtue, nay, the notion of virtue is not to be arrived at, except through direct contemplation of the divine essence. Courage, then, for, quote, the persuasion that we must search that which we do not know will render us beyond comparison better, braver, and more industrious than if we thought it impossible to discover what we do not know. And unless to search for it, he secures a position not to be commanded by his passion for reality. Valuing philosophy only as it is the pleasure of conversing with the real thing, with the real being. The full of the genius of Europe he said, culture. I beg your pardon, I'm going to read that again. The full of the genius of Europe, he said, culture. He saw the institutions of Sparta and recognized more genially, one would say, than any science, the hope of education. He delighted in every accomplishment and every graceful and useful and truthful performance. Above all, in the splendors of genius and intellectual achievement. Quote, the whole of life, O Socrates, end quote, said Glau Glauco, quote, is with the wise the measure of hearing such discourses as these, end quote. What a price he sets on the feats of talent, on the powers of pericles, of uh, Isocrates of Pamenides, what a price above price on the talents themselves. He called the several faculties gods in his beautiful wisdom, in his beautiful personation. What values he gives to the art of gymnastic and education, what to geometry, what to music, what to astronomy, whose appeasing and medicinal power he celebrates. In the Timaeus, he indicates the highest employment of the eyes. Quote, by us it is asserted that God invented and bestowed sight on us for the purpose that on surveying the circles of intelligence in the heavens we might properly employ those of our minds which, though disturbed when compared with the others that are uniform, are still allied to their circulations. And that having thus learned and being naturally possessed of a correct reasoning faculty we might imitating the uniform revolutions of divinity set right our own wanderings and blunders, end quote. And in the Republic, quote, by each of these disciplines, a certain organ of the soul is both purified and reanimated, which is blinded and buried by studies of another kind, an organ better worth have saving than 10,000 eyes, since truth is perceived by this alone. End quote. He said, culture, but he first admitted its basis and gave immeasurably the first place to advantages of nature. His patrician tastes laid stress on the distinctions of birth and the action of the organic character and disposition is the origin of caste. Quote, such as were fit to govern into their composition, the informing deity, mingled gold, into the military silver, iron and brass for hub husbandmen and artificers. End quote. The East confirms itself in all ages in this faith. The Quran is explicit on this point of caste. Quote, Men have their metal as of gold and silver. Those of you who were the worthy ones in the state of ignorance 
will be the worthy ones in the state of faith as soon as you embrace it. End quote. Plato is not less firm. Of the five orders of things, only four can be taught to be generality of men. End quote. In the Republic, he insists on the temperaments of the youth. At first, as first of the first. A happy example of the stress laid on nature is in the dialogue with a young Thagus, who wishes to receive lessons from Socrates. Socrates declares that if some have grown wise by associating with him, no thanks are due to him. But simply whilst they were with him, they grew wise, not because of him. He pretends not to know the way of it. Quote, it is adverse to many, nor can those be benefited by associating with me, whom he demon opposes, so that it is not possible for me to live with these. With many, however, he does not prevent me from conversation, who yet are not at all benefited by associating with me. Such oath, I guess, is association with me. For if it pleases the God, you will make great and rapid proficiency. You will not, if he does not please Judge whether it is not safer to be instructed by someone of those who have power over the benefit which they impart to men than by me who benefit or not, just as it may happen. Quote. And if he had said, I have no system, I cannot be answerable for you, you will be what you must. If there is love between us, inconceivably delicious and profitable, will our intercourse be if not your time is lost, and you will only annoy me, I shall seem to you stupid, and the reputation I have falls quite above us. Beyond the will of you or me is a secret, a friendly or a repulsion laid. All my good is magnetic, and I educate not by lessons, but by going about my business. He said culture, he said nature, and he failed not to add. There is also the divine. There is no thought in any mind, but it quickly tends to convert itself into a power and organizes a huge instrumentality of means. Plato, lover of limits, loved the illimitable, saw the enlargement and nobility which came from truth itself and good itself and attempted as if on the part of human intellect once for all to do. Once for all to do it Adequate homage, homage fit for the immense soul to receive, and yet homage becoming the intellect to render. He said then, our faculties run out, of, out into infinity and return to us thence. We can define but a little way. But here is a fact which will not be skipped and which to shut our eyes upon is suicide. All things are in a scale. And begin where we will ascend and ascend. All things are symbolical. And what we call results are beginnings. A key to the method and completeness of Plato is his twice bisected line. After he has illustrated the relation between absolute good and true and the forms of the intelligible world, he says, quote, Let there be a line cut in two unequal parts. Cut again each of these two main parts one representing the visible, the other the intelligible world. And let these two sections represent the bright part of the dark part, the bright part and the dark part of each of these worlds. You will have for one of the sections of the visible world images that is both shadows and reflections for the other section. The, sub, the objects of these images that is plants, animals and the works of art and nature the divine, the intelligible world, in like manner, the one section will be of opinion and hypothesis, and the other section of truths. Unquote. To these four sections, the four operations of the soul correspond conjecture, faith, understanding, reason. As every pool reflects the image of the sun, so every thought and thing restores us an image and creature of the supreme good. The universe is, is perforated by a million channels for his activity. All things mount and mount. All his thought has this ascension. Phaedrus, teaching that beauty 
is the most lovely of all things, exciting hilarity and shedding desire and confidence through the universe wherever it enters. And it enters in some degree into all things, but that there is another which is as much more beautiful than beauty, as beauty is than chaos, namely wisdom, which our wonderful organ of sight cannot reach onto, but which could it be seen, would ravish us with its perfect reality. He has the same regard to it as the source of excellence in works of art. When an artificer, he says, in the fabrication of any work, looks to that which always subsists according to the same, and employing a model of this kind, expresses its idea and power in his work. It must follow that his production should be beautiful. But when he beholds that which is born and dies, it will be far from beautiful. Thus ever the banquet is a teaching in the same spirit, familiar not to all the poetry and to all the sermons of the world, that the love of the sex is initial and symbolizes at a distance the passion of the soul for that immense lake of beauty it exists to seek. The faith in the, divin in the divinity is never out of mind and constitutes the ground of all his dogmas. Body cannot teach wisdom, God only. In the same mind, he can constantly aff in the same mind, he constantly affirms that virtue cannot be taught and that it is not a science, but an inspiration, that the great, greatest goods are produced to us through the manual and are assigned to us by a divine gift. This leads me to that central figure which he has established in his academy, as the organ through which every considered opinion shall be announced, and whose biography he has likewise so labored that the historic facts are lost in the light of Plato's mind. Socrates and Plato are the double star which the most powerful instruments will not entirely separate. Socrates, again, in his traits and genius, is the best example of that synthesis, which constitutes Plato's extraordinary power. Socrates, a man of humble stem, but honest enough, of the commonest history, of a personal homeliness, so remarkable as to be a cause, wit, a cause of wit in others. The rather that his broad and good nature and exquisite taste for a joke invited the sally, which was short to be paid. The players personated him on the stage. The potters copied his ugly face on their stone jokes. He was a cool fellow, adding to his humor, a perfect temper and a knowledge of his man. Be he who he might, whom he talked with, which laid the companion open to a certain defeat in any debate. And in debate, he moderately delighted. The young men are prodigious, prod prodigiously fond of him and invite him to their feats. Whither he goes for conversation, he can drink too, has the strongest heads in Athens, and after leaving the whole party under the table goes away as if nothing had happened. To begin new dialogues with somebody that is sober. In short, he was what our country people call an old one. He affected a good many citizen-like tastes, was monstrously fond of Athens, hated trees, never willingly went beyond the walls, knew the old characters, valued the boars and philistines, for, an, for everything in Athens a little better than anything in any other place. He was plain as a Quaker in habit and speech. Affected low phrases and illustrations from cook, from cocks and quails, soup pans and sycamore spoons, grooms and fairies, grooms and fairies, and unnameable offices. Especially if he talked with any superfine person, he had a Franklin-like wisdom. Thus he showed one who was afraid to go on foot to Olympia that it was no more than his daily walk with door, within doors. If continuously extended, would easily reach plain old uncle as he was, with his great ears and immense talker, the rumour ran that on one or two occasions in the war with Boatia, Boatia he had shown a determination which had covered with the retreat of a troop, and that there was some story that under cover of folly he had in the city government, when one day he chanced to hold a seat there, evinced a courage in opposing, seeing the popular voice, which had well nigh ruined him. He is very poor, but then he is hardly a soldier, and can live on a few olives, usually in this in the strictest sense, on bread and water, except when entertained by his friends. His necessary expenses were exceedingly small, and no one could live as he did. He wore no undergarment, his upper garment was the same for summer and winter, and he went barefooted. And it is said that to procure the pleasure which he loves of talking, 
at his ease all day, one of the most elegant and cultivated young men, he will now and then return to his shop and cough statues, good or bad for sale, however that be, it is certain that he had grown to delight in nothing else than this conversation, and that under his hypocritical pretense of knowing nothing, he attacks and brings down all the fine speakers, all the fine philosophers, all the fine philosophers of Athens, whether native or strangers from Asia Minor and the islands. Nobody can refuse to talk with him. He is so honest and really curious to know. A man who was willingly confuted if he did not speak the truth, and who willingly confuted others asserting what was false, and not less pleased when confuted than when confuted. For he thought not any evil happened to men of such a magnitude as false opinion respecting a just and unjust, a pitiless disputant, who knows nothing but the bounds of whose conquering intelligence no man had ever reached, whose temper was imp imperturbable, whose dreadful logic was always leisurely and sportive, so careless and ignorant as to disarm the weariest and draw them in the pleasant, pleasantest manner into horrible doubts and confusion, but he always knew the way out, knew it, yet would not tell it. No escape he drives from two terrible choices by his dilemmas and tosses of and tosses the Hippias and Gorgias with their grand reputations as a boy tosses his both the Trainus the Turnus Realis. Menno had discoursed a thousand times at length on virtue before many companies and very well as it appears to him as it appeared to him. But at this moment he cannot even tell what it is this crime fish of a Socrates has so bewitched him. We are currently on page four ninety. I'm gonna carry on on the next video, carrying on on page four ninety. Continuing on page four ninety. Please share your thoughts, your comments, your feedback, and please subscribe if you haven't already. And let me know what you think of this amazing book. I look forward to hearing from you. Have a beautiful, lovely day. I love you. Take care. Keep on shining a beautiful light.